Hey, how are you all doing? My name is Kevan Davani, the Total Connector, host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. Really excited to announce my next talk with Juraj Bettner. He is a technologist, IT hacker, explorer, Bitcoiner, and uh, you know he has got a great vision for parallel communities. And since I'm you know doing myself a project, a film project on human life rooted in Bitcoin, uh, and after talking you know to uh, so many great minds and spirits such as Grant Romund, Jeff Booth, Titus Gable of Free Private Cities, um, yeah, and we're going to talk about a lot of things: digital privacy, uh, censorship resistance, uh, parallel communities, Bitcoin, freedom, and yeah. Without further ado. Let me know what you think. The event's going to be taking place from October 2nd to 4th. Uh, uh, it's going to be one of the speakers at the uh, 7th Annual Hackers Congress Parallelni Poli Police, as I pronounce it hopefully correctly, in Prague. Uh, the theme is Digital Totality and it's going to be a bunch of, you know, uh, other cohorts such as myself, speakers, panelists, uh, freedom seeking, you know, libertarians, Bitcoiners. So get your tickets. The discount code is total Bitcoin or Kevin Davani, total Bitcoin, one word or Kevin Davani, one word, whatever is easier for you. Let me know your questions afterwards. Hope you love it. Share it, retweet it, uh, follow me on Twitter, uh, on YouTube, podcast platforms, whatever you do. Thanks so much. And if you wish to contribute to the film project, DM me or write me an email at hello at the total connector.com. Excited yeah, for this talk and talk to you soon. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. I'm so pleased and excited to announce my very special guest, Juraj. Oh, I gotta turn off my, my sound here. I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. So, Juraj, thank you so much for your time and coming on my show. Um, you are, you know, Juraj is an entrepreneur. Serial entrepreneur, uh, technologist, IT hacker, explorer, podcaster. What's the name of your podcast, George? Option Plus. Uh, yeah. that's the that's the English podcast. I have another one in Slovak, um, but uh, but the English one is very new. Only four episodes so far. Right. So great. Yeah, and I listened by the way to your uh, awesome interview with with Max Hillebrand. Uh, which you know we can still talk about it later. Um, you talk about you know in general principles of Austrian economics, praxeology, sort of the study of the human behavior, uh, amongst other things. So maybe we can you know uh, dive a little bit deeper. But of course, you know it's this is I, I think this is the first interview in connection with the uh, seventh annual um, Hackers Congress Parallelly Polis from October 2nd uh, to October 4th in Prague. Uh, and uh, yeah, get your tickets now. The, if you wanna you know, uh, have a discount, the discount code, my discount code is total Bitcoin. Okay, Van Davani, but total Bitcoin, I think is much easier. So um, maybe for my listeners, you wanna tell me my listeners, like, first of all, about your background, your, you know, your journey to Bitcoin, what is your vision? Like what kind of fundamental, fundamental problems are you trying to solve? And what is this whole Congress about? Because I'm sure a lot of listeners don't know anything about that. Yes. So the Congress is connected to the space where it's happening, which is Parallel Police in Prague. And uh, when we opened it, we wanted an event to uh, to launch it and have a have an opening party so we invited a bunch of interesting uh, speakers and we've been doing it every year since then so the space has um, three floors plus basement and we consider the congress the virtual fourth floor because that's uh, it's not in space but it's in time and in the whole space and we call uh, very interesting people um, from uh, from the field, not only from Bitcoin, um, but we are looking at building parallel communities. We are looking uh, how to um, increase our freedom. And uh, Bitcoin is, of course, a big part of that, but it's a very different conference to other, let's say, Bitcoin or, or blockchain conferences. I don't like uh, blockchain uh, per se that much, but uh, it's also about opting out, about uh, several hacks, how you can uh, how you can live more free in this world. Uh, so it's not... Uh, 
as much uh, or technology is not the only focus so our, our space has uh, uh, if you've seen the logo of Parallelpolis, it's a triangle and uh, the triangle represents uh, art science and technology so we try to kind of um, uh, put all these together so there are there's uh, uh, bitcoin related artwork uh, on show and uh, many many projects going on um, art is very important to us uh, because um, uh, actually the space was founded by an art group which is very different to uh, to many uh, many spaces or events uh, related to Bitcoin because it's usually, you know, IT people and uh, later maybe Austrian economists that are interested in Bitcoin. Um, but um, this was started by an art group and and inspired by one of our uh, one of our projects that we've been doing. And um, um, I think it's uh, it's very unique, uh, a very very different atmosphere. I've been to many many conferences, and uh, uh, um, what I would say is that uh, people um, discuss uh, also quite controversial topics. So, for example, we had people uh from panama right after panama papers and uh, it, this was one of the very few venues where we actually uh allowed them to speak uh, uh, uh and uh, tell people their point of view we even had uh, um, uh, jim bell from uh, the, the author of assassination politics which is probably the the, <laughs> the only place uh, he was allowed to speak but the discussion was very very interesting so so I think it's quite unique and uh, it's also virtual. So if people want to uh, join in and are afraid of infections, uh, no need to come to Prague this year physically. Awesome. Yeah. Um, see, you, so so you mentioned a couple of things that which I, I find, uh, at, you know, especially at this time, really interesting. And I pulled up that article also because you, you know, talked about um, the Panama Papers, and I think maybe you were alluding also to the Finchian investigative uh, uh, thing that, that uh, you know, uh, sort of came to the surface. Um, because I'm trying to, you know, first articulate what are the fundamental problems and who, uh, what is the real, like, criminality going on? Because, you know, uh, there's so much oppression, surveillance, uh, uh, systematic theft, you know, by governments and central banking taking place. And uh, we just heard, re re you know, recently through uh, the, the leaked documents in connection with the Finchen and, uh, you know, the, the suspicious uh, activities reports that have come to the surface in just a tiny fraction of actually what we know, because the two trillion dollars in transactions which have been money laundered is just a tiny fraction. So we don't actually know, you know, the, the total amount of the 17 year period uh, in, you know, in connection with that, uh, where the documents have come to the surface. So, um, but then but then you know we we live in a really schizophrenic state of uh, of state and 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 and, and lawmaking processes and and you know and and, and society. Um, I mean, where do you see the fundamental problem? Uh, because you talked about freedom. How do we how do we achieve freedom uh, and 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 digital privacy and um, uh, you know more self sovereignty and autonomy self autonomy uh, in this kind of society? So last year, the topic of my talk was uh, financial surveillance and crypto utopias. So <laughs> the solution for, for me is uh, cryptocurrencies uh, and not only for as a store of value, everyone is hodling, you know, everyone is excited that, uh, that Bitcoin will go to the moon, the t-shirt with the moon. <laughs> uh, but uh, I think um, uh, perceiving uh, cryptocurrencies as uh, payment networks uh, is also important and uh, i believe it's uh, basically an internet protocol for uh, for paying or for for sending something that is scarce um uh, and uh, we didn't have a protocol for uh, for doing such a thing before. So PayPal is not a pay, uh, an internet protocol, it's a service. And you can uh, tell PayPal to send money from A to B, but it's not happening over, over the internet. It's a private network of 
credit card companies, banks, and so on. So, so cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, uh, but Bitcoin, I mean, Bitcoin on chain, Bitcoin Lightning, uh, Liquid, uh, uh, and all the other protocols actually work uh, quite well for for sending something that is scarce is a native protocol. It's like uh, if someone invented email and now it was possible to uh, uh, avoid censorship, uh, avoid uh, surveillance uh, and all these things and uh, also avoid third parties. So it's peer to peer. Um, about money laundering, um, I personally believe that money laundering is a made up crime. It doesn't exist. It's, a, it's an admission of the authorities that they cannot solve real crimes so they're looking at the at the financial flows so of course if someone is doing extortion or uh, whatever some something uh, something evil um, that is something that uh, of course in every society not only state society but free society we would like uh, someone to invest investigate uh, maybe uh, maybe let them pay for damages uh, uh, punish them, whatever. Um, but because the police is not effective in stopping these kind of crimes, uh, they figured out, okay, let's look at the money. And now we have this whole uh, uh, system of trying to evade money laundering. But for me, you know, euro is a euro, dollar is a dollar, <laughs> gold coin is a gold coin, bitcoin is bitcoin. So I think this um, uh, uh, it is very useful that ma money is fungible and we don't need to, you know, when I pay with uh, uh, a 10 euro bill in groceries for my groceries, I don't want the cashier to ask me if I uh, maybe got it for selling someone weed or, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't make any sense. So um first of all so so first of all i perceive uh, all this uh, anti money laundering craze as um as um, kind of inability of of um, the the police maybe and and the states to punish uh, investigate and punish real crimes so um that being said, uh, what this new FinCEN revelation says is uh, basically that uh, 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 that banks are doing it much more. You know, uh, it's it's such a huge amount that Bitcoin <laughs> pales in comparison. It's it's not even you know it's, it doesn't even hit a radar. So uh, uh, so it's very weird. Uh, for example, one of the banks that I use. Uh, closed my bank account because I received uh, 1,000 euros from a cryptocurrency exchange, and uh, it was too risky for them, and uh, all the all this craziness. And uh, you know, there are uh, uh, some um, uh, there are some uh, uh, people that are or, or organizations that are doing this uh, and uh, and there's no way that uh, this is invisible you know uh, all these transactions have to be investigated by risk management of these banks so so i i think there's zero probability that they just missed it and it was uh, you know <laughs> uh, by accident you know that there had to be someone who knew what this transaction is and that it went through so uh, right now um the the way that the banking system works it's uh, i would say uh too tightly controlled for for these things to happen unnoticed so but they're happening and and it's the same it's the same thing as uh people saying you know cryptocurrencies are for buying drugs um no us dollars are for bu <laughs> buying drugs exactly and you know, I mean, just look at the banks that um, that have mentioned uh, Deutsche Bank, HSBC. I mean, these are all banks, and and you know, it starts, of course, from the top, the central banks with, with zero uh, accountability, zero transparency, criminal immunity. You're just you know, just starting. I mean, I wrote articles about the Bank of International Settlements, but you know, this is not about me. This is about you, <laughs> as you are. So um, let's go. Yeah, let's go a little bit um, deeper. So what are we? I'm trying to like to like discuss with you like what is the practical approach for people now like what where should we strive to what 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 should we build what should we create because I'm a huge fan you know of of um, 
of Seasteading Institute. Of uh, I, I just talked to Grant Romund of Ocean Builders. I talked to Titus Gebel of Free Private Cities together with Jeff Booth. It was a really fascinating conversations we've had. And, and I think this is the future. Uh, in my opinion, this is the future. We need to build and create new structures so that we don't have to fight the old system. But of course, you know, I, there's one thing that I'm really concerned about, and that's sort of the physical aggression of the state government, uh, which the digital realm cannot solve. Uh, you know, I'm talking about violence, aggression, and the violation of property. And I think that would need sort of a separate, uh, you know, separate chapter on that. Uh, how do you, how do you defend, you know, from, uh, from, from that kind of uh, violence and aggression? Uh, what is your position like when it comes to creating new structures where we could even eventually even create um, and, you know, establish new uh, circular local economies? Uh, we just, you know, before we start recording, you talked about like what what could Bitcoin be, you know, as a media exchange unit of account. How can, how can we make it more, you know, practical? So um, I would maybe start by recommending people to read uh, the short book Second Realm by Smuggler and X Y Z. It's online. If you Google Smuggler and Second Realm, uh, you can you can find it online. It's a very short book that uh, talks exactly about this problem. And uh, I think that is something that uh, we refer to in the name of our project. And uh, um, maybe I will explain. So parallel police, police is not uh, police like cops, but with S uh, at the end, uh, which it comes from Greek. Uh, most people would translate it as a city, but it's the smallest societal unit. So that's the, that's the community, that's the parallel community. And uh, it was um, a strategy. Uh, I come from Czechoslovakia. I was born during the authoritarian communist regime. And um, there were uh, two kinds of people that tried to do something about, about the regime. There were reformists um, and uh, radicals, let's say. And they, uh, they both had a strategy. So reformists uh, tried to do what uh, uh, people who believe in political change do uh, these days. So they said, okay, let's talk with the, with the communist party, try to influence them and, and let's hope they will listen and become better. Uh, the radicals uh, were you know, dreaming about overthrowing the regime and, and so on. And one of the... Uh, one of the uh, members of the of the dissent was Václav Benda, and he wrote this essay, uh, basically uh, uh, explaining that uh, both reformist and radical uh, approaches failed, and that we need something different, and that something different is to create parallel society. So I'll give a few examples of how it worked in practice and how how we do it. Uh, but before I do that, um, uh, I want to point out how it relates to crypto anarchy. So why crypto anarchy works? If you do a deal online on a dark market, uh, the reason that uh, uh, that you are not investigated, there are no, uh, there's no state interference, is first of all, no one sees the transaction because it's encrypted, it's peer to peer, and so on. If they see the transaction, they don't understand it. Uh, so they maybe see, okay, someone sent money somewhere, but they don't know what exactly was happening. Uh, even if they see it, if something goes wrong, it is very difficult to prove it. Uh, and even if they can prove it, uh, they cannot easily act. So, so to actually go find your physical body and put you to jail might be very difficult, even if they know that you are from somewhere and so on. So this is called the OODA loop. So observe, orient, decide, act. So if you break any of these parts, then any state regulation uh, doesn't work because if they don't know about it, if they don't know what's going on, if they cannot uh, make a decision uh, using court system or they cannot act, then, uh, then basically they cannot do anything. Um, so the examples uh, in physical space. So for example, it was mandatory to send your children uh, to state schools. 
uh, they would teach them, you know, Marxism, Leninism, and uh, all, all these crazy things, uh, uh, scientific atheism, there was uh, no religious freedom. Um, uh, so that was one problem. On the other hand, uh, if you didn't have a good background, for example, your cousin uh, escaped to the West or something like that, so even a family ties, uh, you were not allowed in university and you would end up in a, you know, as a miner in a, uh, in a mine or, or uh, doing some, some uh, uh, true working class job uh, uh, like in a, in a factory or something like that. So they said, okay, uh, this problem, we cannot reform it. We cannot overthrow the school system. But what we can do is we can uh, create an evening school in someone's apartment, uh, find someone who can teach, you know, Western philosophy or, or even a university subject. We would gather people, either children or uh, uh, or teenagers or or whoever, and we can teach them. So so the strategy is, don't go you know head against the wall and break all the laws because you are very radical, <laughs> but uh, but create a situation where you comply. So so uh, sending your children to this horrible school, which is uh, I would call it jail, <laughs> not school, but okay. Um, Sending them to the school is basically risk management. The only reason why uh, why uh, you send your children there is you don't want uh, uh, the state to take the children from you and put them in some orphanage or somewhere. Um, and on top of that, you create this parallel structure which has these crypto anarchist principles. So the cops don't know that the parallel school is happening. Uh, if they know, you know, everyone is pretending they're just having a, an apartment party <laughs> uh, uh, and they cannot prove it and so on. So, so it, it works exactly like a dark market transaction. So Vatsal Benda in his essay, he, um, he was talking about education information exchange which was back then mostly uh, typewriter copying of of texts and uh, very effective distribution that was important and that that was i would say his innovation uh, because before the uh, the distribution was based on uh, how important someone was in the underground <laughs> Um, so if Václav Havel, who became the first president of uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, didn't see a newsletter, he would get it first. But uh, Václav Benda said no, said no. The best way to, to do it is uh, find someone who can type the fastest and uh, can make most copies. And, and that's, uh, that's fast. Then they had... Um, international communication with uh, international organizations. They had parallel culture, which actually started this idea because it was thriving even back then in the late seventies um, and so on. So, uh, so this parallel also, uh, of course, black market, which was, he didn't uh, uh, like the idea that much, but then he realized that it actually needs to be done. And the main part of black market was, uh, uh, was parallel charity uh, because a lot of people who went against the regime uh, they were sanctioned economically they would not get a good job or they would uh, get fired from a job and, um, and the state would you know take their apartment or something like that um, so so this is a strategy and we can see it even now every day so I'll give you a very current example that everyone knows which is um, uh, ride-sharing applications, so Uber and Lyft. Uh, they're providing uh, lowering of the transaction costs. That's their main business. And one of the transaction costs is actually how to enforce the contract, how to make sure that everyone gets what they what they asked for. So um, my friend, uh, Robert Hovanculiak, who is an Austrian economist, he's, uh, he likes to say that um, uh, Uber and Lyft are not competing as much with the taxi companies but with the parliament <laughs> and why is that because they make their rules in order to uh, satisfy the customers they they need to set the rules in a way uh, in which the customers are happy 
and they're competing with the with the rules of the uh, traditional ta taxi licenses and so on. So this is uh, a parallel system that competes uh, based on the fact that you have a different set of rules. Uh, in some countries, they operate and it's completely illegal. For example, on, on, in Bali or, um, or in Colombia, uh, you can get an Uber. It's illegal, but uh, Uber doesn't care. Uh, they get their payments processed abroad and, and it just works. So, so it's very interesting that, that this, can, this can actually happen. And the reason is that it's quite difficult to enforce. Um, so this is another kind of parallel society. Uh, the kinds of uh, parallel societies that we try to create, um, um, because always the question is, okay, how do you enforce these rules? Uber has it easy, you know, the driver doesn't follow the rules, they kick them out of the system and, and they don't need a judge, they don't need courts, they don't need, uh, you know, anything. It doesn't even need to, need to be in a contract, you know, less than four stars, goodbye. Um, with uh, communities that you create, uh, um, if they have these properties, uh, there should be a clear difference between who is in and who is out. And there should be a barrier to entry and the value uh, that people get by being participants of this community. So, for example, uh, in my community in Bratislava, when I want to cooperate with someone, uh, for example, I write a book, I, I need an editor and I need a graphics designer. And um, we have this, you know, we have shared values. We know um, how to um, how to interact with with each other. You know, we uh, we pay each other in Bitcoin and so on. But I'm not afraid that these people will break the contract because they want to stay part of this community. So if they have a conflict with me, either I go or they go, or we come to an agreement. So we don't need a formal court, you know, with hammers and <laughs> and stuff but uh, uh, but we can enforce uh, these rules by these two uh, features so in group and uh, out group and a barrier to entry so we don't you know just invite everyone of course you can come to parallel police to get a coffee or see a talk but if you want to be part of the community part of the group uh, you need to invest uh, at least uh, some of your time and so people should uh, get to know you they should um, know your values and people should uh, be in sync about the values they should uh, they should agree on the values so uh, and uh, what is also important is that this community uh, keeps internal things private so uh, the first rule of parallel police in Bratislava, I don't know if they have it in Prague, but in Bratislava, the first rule is do not call the police. You know, something gets stolen. Okay, we try to solve it ourselves. The police uh, would uh, probably just, you know, write down what happened <laughs> and document the case, but uh, it's very rare that they actually solve some crime. Um, but we try to solve... Uh, any disputes, any any problems ourselves, uh, even with the neighbors. So so um, by uh, agreeing to these values, you can actually create a parallel rule set, parallel let's say legal system. But that's an overstatement. It's just a simple, you know. Which is which is actually isn't that like you you that would be like living the the libertarian. You know freedom principles of Austrian economists who have been you know preaching this you know like like uh, and even Torsten Poller Dr. Torsten Poller one of the you know renowned I mean he's a gold bug but he's a really amazing Austrian economist he wrote this book like with money to world dominance it's still in German but being translated to English and he said everything can be taken care of by private you know by private contractual partners you know even le legal you know sort of uh, disputes you know any any kind of disputes you know can be taken care of we don't need any kind of government the, the government is obsolete, actually, you know, so, yeah, this is what I was yeah, thinking. Yeah, uh, uh, Paul Rosenberg says that we live in a uh, bronze age system with a space age technology, <laughs> which I really like. It's so true. Um, on the other hand, um, 
what I what I think is important to notice is that uh, the market doesn't just magically solve it. You know, someone has to do it, and um, with solving disputes, you know, you can uh, invent it as you go. You don't need to first create a sophisticated legal system and and uh, and uh, you know then realize you actually don't need to use it at all. So so you can uh, you can. Uh, uh, provide these services by, you know, uh, um, uh, finding some people to uh, as uh, who will uh, who would act as arbiters of disputes or something like that. So it doesn't have to be very difficult. Um, but what I um, what I find uh, uh, some as quite common uh, point of view among um, you know uh, anarcho capitalists or libertarians is that. Uh, they use this magic formula that market will solve this <laughs> and uh, it will only solve it if there's demand and if someone actually wants this service and pays for it. Uh, so there are many things even in our parallel communities that are not solved and, and you know, someone has to do it. And what is uh, interesting that relates to this is um, what I noticed uh, is that um, there are two ways to approach freedom. So uh, when we created, when we started creating this community, uh, you know, there were people coming in from outside. They were happy because suddenly they didn't have a boss and no one was telling them what to do. And they felt really free. And it was, um, it was very uh, liberating for them to participate in this freedom minded community. But then uh, uh, a lot of those people didn't know what to do with the freedom, you know, because it's not enough to be free and now what? Okay, so no one is telling you what to do. So you're sitting in a chair and looking around, <laughs> you know, and uh, I found that even, um, uh, even uh, among uh, libertarians, freedom-minded people, only a small per percentage um, kind of has this... Um, I call it freedom too. So, so you have freedom from, uh, you know, someone telling you what to do and there's freedom to do something. And that's the creative part. That's the entrepreneurial part that, uh, that you actually need to create something. So, uh, that was my personal hobby was how to uh, ignite this, uh, this freedom too in people, how to, um, uh, how to, uh, explain them or convince them that they can actually do something and not ask anyone so so they were still they they had these habits so they had an idea and they would uh, you know go to a group and ask people okay can i do this and we were like oh, whatever <laughs> if you want to do it do it uh, we can tell you what we think about the idea but uh, um uh, you don't need to, you don't need permission and you can just do it. So so that's also very interesting uh, that um, people need to understand that that the second part of freedom is actually acting and the market will not provide anything. <laughs> Someone has to do it. You talked about um, which I find interesting about the black market and we have we've had these discussions. Uh, it's really interesting with uh, you know Eric Vasquez. Uh, you know who, no, who called no. Eric Rusko, He calls himself like the rational. He's you know a super like uh, uh, also uh, you know uh, technologies and and and, Bitco and Bitcoiner and, and coder and and he used to be like a military fighter in the U.S. Uh, but but he's like he calls himself a rational economist uh, and uh, and he always said you know like that that Bitcoin is actually black market money. So so and I always say you know. If it's black market money, well, then it should be adopted, you know, by eight billion people because there is then, you know, there is no black market money then, you know, there's just uh, Bitcoin. So, do you see this process? Uh, do you think we can we can accelerate or, or or facilitate this process of of people understanding that, you know, in order to free yourself from uh, strangulation or uh, uh, you know state governmental. Uh, um, intrusion or uh, censorship that eventually you know it will become the you know the money itself and maybe even facilitate it in a circular economy within that's why I'm such a huge fan of these free private cities you know um, uh, which is I think the first official product project by D2 Skable is in Honduras 
And I think if, if all these uh, free private cities, you know, uh, evolve or, or grow in many parts of the world, um, maybe that's my naive imagination that this, you know, that it will just uh, attract uh, not only, you know, uh, liberty minded or freedom minded, freedom seeking people, but also entrepreneurs, investors, uh, you know, the right community to build these kind of structures. I think that uh, uh, we should start with people who really desire uh, this kind of money. So I'm um, personally, I don't think that right now Bitcoin is for everyone. Uh, and the reason is that there are uh, barriers to entry in people's minds. You know, there are a lot of so. Uh, so Parallel Police uh, is uh, crypto only. So we accept Bitcoin and a few other cryptocurrencies, Litecoin, Monero. Uh, and so so if you want to get in and get a coffee, you cannot pay with check rounds on euros. We, we just don't accept it. There's an ATM and uh, the barista would gladly teach you how you can buy your first Bitcoin and, and so on. But still, uh, maybe maybe even half of the people who just come from the street and they see a cafeteria when they realize they have to you know uh, go somewhere install something and uh, get bitcoin and pay with it that they they would just turn around and leave and i think that this is perfectly okay right now i think that um that the uh, the that uh Bitcoin is kind of a filter that we let in people who actually desire this uh, uh, this uh, freedom or parallel economy or financial sovereignty, what, whatever that they desire. It's kind of a very rough filter, uh, but you can see, okay, these are the people who are willing to make an investment and the others, maybe it's not just not their time. So, uh, so I think that uh, that's one barrier. Another barrier is uh, things like volatility, uh, which uh, we are uh, running an organization only on Bitcoin. So we need to uh, do accounting in it and everything. And we have found ways to cope with that. But for most people, this is a huge problem and they just hate it. You know, they, it's, it's, you can explain to them, but okay, but you can make use of it. You know, this is how... Um, how to do it we've been doing it for years now and and it works and it helped us so many uh, so many times not only uh, not only in bull markets but also in bear markets you can uh, you can play with it and uh, and uh, um, uh, and it can actually work for you uh, but mentally you know uh, uh, the the state currencies that people think in um, it's a, it's like a language you know if you tell someone one million Satoshi, they don't know what it means. You know, they, uh, uh, Slovakia, where I'm from, switched from uh, Slovak crowns to euros and uh, in 2009 and 11 years later, there are still some people who see, uh, see um, uh, price in euros and they would multiply it by 30 to understand what it means, you know, and, and it's, uh, and understand the real inflation, you know, once you think, because if yeah, I remember yeah. back the Austrian shillings, I mean, it's crazy what kind of, of, of prices are not, you know, being demanded for a cup of coffee. I'm like, this is hype inflation. This is like, if you, if you, you know, if you know, yes. if you've lived through those ages, you know, exactly. So, uh, I think, um, uh, uh it is so so i don't think that we should uh, uh, push people too hard to hodl and you know um, uh, do these things uh, so what i like to see more is people uh, installing a lightning wallet you know do, uh, settle small debts among friends you know you go uh, to a lunch or to a coffee with uh, five friends you know someone pays and others send him bitcoin uh, just to play with it just to understand what it means um, I always uh, talk about privacy. Uh, that is very important because on the internet we don't have privacy uh, regarding payments and it's much worse than most people think. So um, in, in my last talk at HCPP, you can see it online about the financial surveillance. Uh, for example, if you go to the website of PayPal, uh, I, I use the German one, but uh, I'm sure it's very similar. 
uh, they say that if you make a transaction, they may share it with, and there's a list of institutions, and there are 600 institutions they might share your, informa- uh, your, your transaction information with, and only maybe one third is uh, actually state institutions. So it's not, uh, not only, you know, tax office or financial police and, and these institutions of all European countries and so on. So it could but be also it, unelected institutions such as what is it called FATFA, F, 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 uh, you know, this unelected uh, FATF. Is, yeah. uh, I, uh-huh. I'm not sure that this one was there. They're more uh, doing recommendations, but there are many marketing organizations that, uh, so they can sell you better products. There are... Um, uh, credit check organizations. So if you uh, if you apply for for a, a loan, uh, they might use your transaction information and so on. So PayPal is not saying that you know every transaction is sent to six hundred um, institutions, but it might. So uh, so uh, and you agree in the you know terms and conditions that you never read <laughs> that this might happen. So. Um, so it's kind of like when you are using your credit card or bank account on the internet, um, I imagine it like, like sparks, you know, you do a transaction and it gets sent to, uh, ad trackers and, uh, financial trackers and so on. And cryptocurrencies are right now the only solution. There's nothing else, you know, you can have your gold coins and, uh, save in gold, which is totally fine. I, I, I like the gold. I, I like physical gold coins. Uh, you can use cash, uh, to protect your privacy, but if you want to order something on, you know, Amazon or whatever, if you don't pay with, uh, with Bitcoin or, uh, or any other cryptocurrency, uh, this is happening in the background all the time. And um, uh, in Slovakia, for example, uh, it is even worse. Uh, it's similar in Czech Republic as well. Uh, the states, in order to collect uh, VAT, they started uh, creating these systems where they collect uh, um, information electronically from all cash registers. So if I go to a pharmacy and I buy uh, a medicine, this information, including the name of the medicine, how much it costs, how much did I buy, the GPS coordinates of, of the sale, um, uh, the name of the merchant and so on, it gets sent to the, uh, to the financial authority. Um, and if you pair this with credit card payment or with uh, uh, geolocation of, of a phone, it's uh, like the data is like a gold mine. And I don't believe it. It will not leak. It's uh, it's a disaster waiting to happen, basically. So, so this is another angle. You know, I don't like telling people this is black market money and you know participate in black market because a lot of people are not um, happy with the black market. Uh, if some if we have this conversation with someone, what I usually say that there is no other market, there is only black market, and in some transactions there is a state that interferes. But uh, you know, all all transactions on the market um, you can call black market, and uh, it, for some transactions you pay taxes. <laughs> Wow, this is incredible. So there are two points that um, just uh, um, went through my mind. Um, first of all, you talked about um, uh, yeah the surveillance and and uh, you know the the tracking and the uh, because you know people don't have any choice. Then I mean the, the thing is you you either you 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 know you you use it or you don't use it, such as in the case of PayPal, right? So uh, so what do you say to people you know who you know it's a, sort of a default answer. It's like Oh, you know, I don't care. I don't have to hide anything. Good for you. <laughs> um, well, uh, I think um, so. Uh, my real answer is usually uh, so. The problem uh, is not that uh, it would be abused today. The problem is that this information is collected by all these institutions, and you don't know what government, what new regulation will be there in five, 10 years. This information is stored for a very long time. 
and even for example people buying bitcoin you know uh, before it was um, uh, before it was regulated by the states you know people believed okay this is uh, you know it doesn't matter uh, i don't have to hide the fact that i own bitcoin now uh, you need to pay 20% on capital gains which you didn't know back then but now it uh, it is happening and um uh, and uh, the rules are changing and they're affecting even the transactions that happened before the change so this is very evil i would say that uh, this goes contrary to any uh, i would say sane legal principles so um, uh, so uh, you know i don't like to use um uh, 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 analogies from from the Second World War. So so uh, so let's let's use the uh, the gold confiscation. Yeah, you know, six one zero two. If you if you yeah exactly. If you uh, if you bought uh, uh, gold on a KYC exchange back then, and right. the state would report it. Uh, oh, sorry, the exchange would report it to the state, then it would be very easy to confiscate and you don't know what is going to happen in the in the future. So this is, uh, I think, uh, very Im important. And also uh, what people don't know is, OK, this is only the exchange. Uh, so so if we speak about uh, KYC and cryptocurrencies, um, uh, People say, OK, I trust Coinbase. I don't mind giving them my ID, whatever. They they know who am I, even if I send a, send a bank transfer. So whatever, it doesn't matter. So first problem is that the document can leak uh, by yeah. hex, by whatever. But many people don't know. There is something called OECD CRS, Common Reporting Standard, which was signed by all civilized countries except US. Um, and um, this means that all the financial institutions anywhere in the world uh, are sending information about accounts of, uh, uh, of tax residents. What, the, what is even worse, so for example, if I have a Slovak passport and if I live in Czech Republic, so my utility bill shows whatever, I live in Prague, my tax residency is in Prague. I register with these two docu documents on, a, on an European exchange. What happens is that just in case, because uh, 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 financial institutions are afraid that they're going to lose their license, so they, they are over compliant. So they, I, and I talked to a few of them while doing the research for, for the book and the talk. Uh, they told me, okay, we will send your information to Slovak and Czech ta tax authorities, so no one complains. So that's the second. Uh, so you thought that you only uh, you are only giving documents to one institution. Now it's one. Uh, it's the exchange and uh, two tax offices. Uh, if the transaction is um, in any way suspicious, for example, it is Monero or it is more than five thousand euros, it gets reported to the financial police of the state where the exchange is in. Then these exchanges are using something that is called chain analysis software. Uh, in the contract with the chain analysis company, they have to share the information also back to the chain analysis. So you think that you are, you know, paying for coffee from your uh, whatever Binance. I don't know exactly which exchange, but let's say let's say you have a Binance app and you think that scanning QR code and sending is the same as using. Uh, Coinomi or Bread Wallet or Trezor or whatever. It's not because um, Binance has a contract with a chain analysis company and they also report back. So they say, okay, customer named Yuri Bednar just sent this transaction as a withdrawal and please include it in your database. So this information follows you. It's not, you know, Binance doesn't tell anyone. They have a, they have a contract uh, with maybe chain analysis or any of these companies. I don't want to um, say that Binance does this because I don't actually know if they have an external contract or they do it internally, but many exchanges that are using these services um, uh, in all contracts uh, that we know about, they're secret, but some of them leaked. Uh, this is happening. So the exchange is two ways. 
Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to ask you about the KYC process because uh, you know you said about you talk you talk about exchanges. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be like an exchange with a main jurisdiction in Europe. It could be like Kraken, who has you know who have to see whatever that is San Francisco, and they have a sort of a subsidiary, or you know, or you transfer your your funds directly to a German account. So they process that and, you know, you still, I mean, it's still over compliant, I think, because you have to submit your passport, your utility bill, your whatever, anything that, you know, where, where I'm like, this is so dangerous, you know, and this is why, uh, because you mentioned also the machines that you have, because you, you, you operate in this organization, uh, uh, Parallel Police, uh, you know, purely on, on Bitcoin standard. Um, so people still have the opportunity, the chance, right, to go to a Bitcoin ATM machine. Yes. So, and we have this regulation still. It's still, I mean, because it's though there's no guarantee it's going to stay this way. Up to 250 euros, you can do that without KYC, which would be, you know, really wise and intelligent to do that. Or, or, at, or if you want to buy more than, you know, one, uh, you know, one threshold after another, you know, up to 250 euros. So I think people are not aware, uh, you know, when you talk about the leakage of documents or leakage of data to criminals, I mean, what if you, you know, get extorted or, or it's, it's highly irresponsible and, and uh, it's beyond grossly negligible. You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, um, and this yes. is why I say to people, you know, just, you know, just do, do it. If you can do non KYC and even pay a, a let's say a tolerable percentage above the spot price or market price, it's worth it. Would it be BISC network or machine or whatever, right? Exactly. Um, actually, for this reason, uh, there are a lot of people from Vienna actually uh, sitting down on a train and coming to Bratislava because the limit in Bratislava is 5,000 uh, euros per transaction and you can do... I didn't know that. Uh, wow. How many? So okay. so uh, if you know the, the in, in Bratislava, we currently don't have the space, but when we had the space, we had, you know, uh, people sitting there for half a day drinking coffee and feeding the machine. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, another thing uh, from uh, from communist Czechoslovakia that inspired me and uh, relates uh, to this was um, uh, these uh, uh, illegal money changers. So if someone was allowed to go to the West and they came uh, back uh, with the Deutsche Marks, uh, they could exchange it for a parallel currency uh, that was operated by Czechoslovak government, which was called Bon, and it was used to buy stuff from the West uh, in in a state-owned uh, shops. Um, uh, you could buy jeans and, and stuff like that if you had foreign currency. But the exchange rate was very bad. So there were these, you know, guys that were standing on the uh, uh, um, in the train train station, bus station. And uh, they would uh, just silently ask you if you want to exchange money and they had a much better exchange rate. Um, uh, they are called in Slovak Vexlaci from Geld Vexel. So that's money exchange, I would say. Is it is it right? I, I, I think so. Um, and, uh, uh, and I believe, so I was making fun of this, you know, a few years back that uh, these uh, Vexlaci will come back. <laughs> And now is the time. Uh, you know there are there are um, uh, signal groups, chat groups uh, for for cities where people say, "Oh, I want to buy thousand uh, euros worth of Bitcoin and so on." And I think this is very important that we uh, that we teach people how to do it, do it without losing money. So so you can use derivatives to to hedge the exchange rate. So you only make a small percentage uh, without actually going through bank accounts. So um, so this is a way for people in parallel economy to uh, to get some additional income and actually serve as the machines because you can easily uh, forbid uh, anyone from operating the machine. It's a big you know chunk of hardware that is very attributable and it has a lot of cash in it. But if there are you know hundreds of people. Uh, trading Bitcoin uh, to one another and making a small percentage on the on the commission. Uh, this solves this problem. And if it worked during, you know, a totalitarian regime uh, and they had uh, some operational security to not end up in jail and uh, do it safely, 
I think we, we should encourage people to do that. And uh, this would uh, even work in smaller cities because it's not uh, profitable to uh, operate an ATM in smaller cities, but uh, you can have easily four people who are just trading and, and making a small commission. So um, I, um, I made an online course about how to do this uh, safely. Uh, it's in Slovak and I'm uh, now working on an English version, but I, I think we really need to spread uh, uh, also these exchangers uh, so they're everywhere. It's fascinating. You know, uh, I'm actually doing some due diligence on, on these uh, Bitcoin ATM machines because uh, I know someone who wants to set up uh, these, um, you know, uh, one or two or, or whatever um, Bitcoin ATM machines. And um, and what I find uh, the interesting part is that I was told by, you know, by people who work uh, for the leading companies here, this, and because I thought most of the transactions are one way. It's like one way Bitcoin ATM, you just buy Bitcoin, right? But I heard it even in Austria, it's like uh, the percentage is like significantly high uh, f for two way Bitcoin ATM. So there's also people who cash out. W what's the situation like in your place? Like do, do people just, just more, or, you know, uh, is it like more substantially more, you know, buyers of Bitcoin or do they also like cash out? I've seen a few people cash out. Uh, we don't operate the machine, so we don't know actually the data about the machine. We only uh, provided the space for it. So I don't know uh, the exact numbers, uh, but uh, uh, I would say that more people would uh, actually do a trend. So in Prague, what usually happens is someone is uh, sitting in the cafeteria and they just, you know, uh, say loudly, does someone want to buy Bitcoin and they cash out in this way. Uh, but of course, some people do it also through the ATM. Um, what is interesting, uh, what uh, I have found is uh, a set of very unlikely people who do that. So, so uh, it is not uncommon that someone comes with 20 or 50 euros and starts asking, okay, how do, I, how do I install this and so on? And you realize that they are either homeless or they're in a huge debt and every, uh, everything they make, uh, someone steals it from them. There's even either someone doing extortion or there's, you know, the, the state uh, authority that, that uh, takes their money. And they're not there, uh, you know, to hodl and wait to the moon. They're, they're, this is the, they're the first way for most of them in years that they are actually able to earn some income and keep it. Uh, there is a law that, uh, uh, that the state cannot take uh, uh, one phone, one smartphone. So they can install a wallet, uh, you know, the state agents, they don't know the wallet and they don't know the password uh, as well. So, um, so this is uh, for, for a lot of people a safe way to actually save money. And these people are also taking it out uh, as cash because they want to use it sometimes. Um, but uh, uh, what was really like, this really shocked me because I didn't even think about this use case. But uh, uh, I think there's a huge misconception about uh, uh, the users of Bitcoin. You know, everyone is uh, saving for retirement and hodling and want to become crypto millionaires and waiting for the moon and all, all this stuff. Uh, but for me, uh, these stories are much more interesting. It's, you know, the... the, the it's, uh, it's like, I'm um, sorry, uh, because it's like, you know, people like in, uh, t you know, inflation and hyperinflationary countries, such as Venezuela, Iran, or whatever, you know, like it's out of necessity. It's because of suffering, pain, like economical, social, existential pain. So this is where people, you know, then flock to Bitcoin. And this is what, what my, you know, high hopes is. Now, besides all this, you know, institutional adoption, which I find great, you know, with Michael Saylor putting half a billion dollars into, and then hopefully, you know, family offices follow and then pension funds who are sitting like on 50 to 70 trillion dollars worth of asset management so it's good i think we need all of them right but um, my hope is for example in iran with 80 million people and the average age of like 80 percent of the population is 30 to 35 years young they're really young people so i'm i'm i'm, I'm thinking because of all the sanctions and embargoes and the and desperation and pain and suffering 
we will f hopefully find, you know, besides this Iran mining that they have now allowed, in the, uh, that, you know, we, we, we we've eventually we will see sort of a critical adoption rate of whatever that is, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million people in Iran. So this is, this is w where my vision goes. And um, yeah, sorry, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's all I wanted to say that, uh, that there are many different uh, use cases and it's not just uh, even like I'm not that excited uh, about uh, institutional investors except for Michael Saylor that, <laughs> that was like <laughs> Michael strategy okay. yeah, he's, he's, a, he, yeah. he's an exception yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the reason is that uh, these institutional investors they uh, they are calling for regulations because they want to, you know, play it safe and uh, yeah. have it uh, in a in a regulated regulated way, and uh, also hedge funds um, and uh, I would say larger investment funds. Um, uh, the reason I I I'm not so happy about it is that no one is saying that they won't go short. You know, going into Bitcoin doesn't mean going long into Bitcoin. They could also short it. So, um, so if someone puts it, um, you know, on their balance sheet as a treasury and they're they're saving as micro strategy, uh, did that's perfectly okay. But um, I think uh, these. Um, big uh, traders and hedge, f hedge funds i think it's a little bit overrated because uh, they use derivatives uh, they they can get leverage they can they can go short as well and, uh, and so they, you think they could presence. they could seriously disrupt the you know the bitcoin's uh volatility even you know by by order of magnitude like to the to the downside or through I don't. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, me neither. I'm, I'm not a I, specialist. I, I, yeah. But you no, know, you neither. know, as Robert Breedlove said, he said that there are approximately there are whatever forty thousand listed companies. I'm not sure is it in the United States or worldwide. <laughs> so um, and there are like five hundred companies that could you know buy the same amount of of bitcoins that Michael Saylor has of, of MicroStrategy. So. Yeah. In the boardrooms, uh, as we've heard, th they had already invested into, like half of the boardroom of Michael Sale had already invested privately into Bitcoin. So yes. I can't imagine that, you know, that there aren't other uh, companies or institutions that have already started at least, you know, uh, planned to um, to accumulate, um, you know, substantial yeah. amounts of yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. You know, and then maybe I know these, all these things going to be obsolete. I know of um, of a member of a bank's board. They are specifically prohibited in investing in Bitcoin in in many of these, mm -hmm. uh, and I know that they you know by uh, using cash and uh, they don't uh, tell their employers. So uh, definitely, like it's a it's a smart move. Um, I think China is very interesting because in China it is. Um, very difficult to save in cash so in slovakia if i wanted to save uh, i don't know 1 million euros you have 500 uh, euro banknotes and you can easily put it in a suitcase and you know uh, put it uh, under your bed or something um, in china i think the largest banknote is around 15 euros or something like that so if you want to save in cash it's a it's a lot of like physical money physical yeah. space if you want to take it out it's uh, uh, there are schemes using art and so on but it's not easy to export capital out so i think that uh, uh, one of the interesting use cases for bitcoin is actually escaping uh, capital controls exactly. south korea That's what I was south say. korea yeah memorizing so, i mean memorizing whatever i mean i think it's still risky memorizing 24 words but there are ways uh, you know where you can whatever distribute sort of uh, or, or you know um, the, the the seed phrase of, uh, but i mean just the, just the thought of it like you can go over the border and and have if, i mean if it's just you know even if it's just a tiny amount but 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 usually it's when we talk yeah. about capital control we talk about like substantial amounts with it being the hundred thousands millions of billions <laughs> so uh, this is crazy this is a really crazy thought uh, like uh, who would have thought that this is possible you know yeah yeah and this is this is true freedom this is true censorship resistance so um i want to tie this in again you know to uh, my favorite topic because you know um 
uh, maybe it's a separate uh, discussion I want to have with you maybe on the next episode is about this free private cities or uh, grand drummonds of ocean builders um, his sea parts or land pay, land based parts uh, in Panama in Panama where they have you know a very friendly you know environment for this you know uh, in terms of taxes in terms of you know getting entrepreneurs investors in creating employment I mean this is a super win-win situation I'm hoping it creates sort of a competitive incentivization for other sort of stable friendly governments to do the same and this is where yes. I see you know by by order of magnitude like so many free private cities or what a because I don't like, you know, the term citadel, because I think I also talked to Moritz Wittesheim, who is one of the speakers at the parliament. He said it might be a disservice, you know, to the community. You know, it's like, hey, see you in the citadel. It sounds sounds like a sort of a sci-fi far off, you know, concept. Yes. It's not. It's not. It's just what is our concrete vision? And, I, and I'm like, I always say, and I wrote an article about this uh, for this film project. And, and I said, you know, if we don't have the trust, the conviction, the concrete comprehension of what it means to convey to the average person out there, to humanity, what it would be like to live a life on a daily basis in a deflationary economics with deflationary technology, at, uh, quoting Jeff Booth, that would be something because then you would attract every you know all these potentials right would it be investors entrepreneurs engineers inventors uh libertarians bitcoiners who have already reserved their places you know you know so i mean i would really love to talk more about this with other uh, you know bitcoiners and libertarian and freedom seeking people and really make this manifest this because the technologies that we can evolve and develop you know in in this sort of a uh, let's say, you know, isolated, uh, you know, in, in protected environment um, is huge. It's just huge. I know? agree. On every I level you can think of, right? I think that there are many ways how to achieve this. So one is getting uh, friendly territory. Uh, I'm actually uh, uh, quite, I, I know quite a lot about Panama. I've uh, done some some business there and I, I'm friendly with local libertarian community and crypto community in Panama. So it's my favorite uh, uh, place to be. So um, uh, what is interesting about, uh, uh, about these uh, uh, freer countries, freer territories is uh, that they have a uh, nice loss but the problem is not the, the the enforcement of the global tax regime doesn't happen through laws. It happens through financial regulations. So, for example, I've been talking to many, um, many, uh, a, a few, let's say, uh, four or five banks in Panama, and their biggest problem right now is actually sending uh, any kind of international transaction. Because they use US dollars, they have to go through a corresponding bank, which is in the US. And even if it's, you know, uh, a farmer buying uh, uh, buying a, a machine for uh, for farming from abroad, uh, it it goes through a lengthy, usually one month investigation. Someone is paying ten thousand or twenty thousand dollars from Panama, which is a high risk jurisdiction, and where it's enforced and where where it's kind of slowing down is not the law the law doesn't forbid it if uh, if you want to buy a tractor or whatever uh, uh, you are a panamanian farmer you want to buy it from us there is no problem you know that there's no law forbidding you do that you know you pay your customs duties taxes and and you just buy it but the transaction doesn't come through because it's high risk even though it's well documented. So uh, actually, I don't think this plan would work without Bitcoin. So that's the, that's the first thing to note that um, uh, one interesting project that you didn't mention, I don't know if you know about it, is Liberland. Um, yeah. that, that's a, that's a, a free startup uh, state <laughs> that is libertarian with voluntary taxes and so on. Is that in Can Croatia? I just ask it. It's between, uh, well, it's a free country, so it's not in Croatia. <laughs> right. okay, it's, uh, yes, it's between Serbia and Croatia. Uh, so the idea is that uh, they have uh, some kind of territorial dispute. And in, uh, uh, if you take uh, 
the version of the borders uh, as both countries would uh, want it, uh, want to have the border. Uh, no country is claiming this small area. It's an island and, and the par part of the land. So these are two uh, on the river Danube. Um, so, uh, so this is a startup country. And what is interesting is that a lot of uh, people say, okay, but it's not recognized or, or something like that. So you cannot do business with them. But that's not true because Taiwan is not recognized by many, even Western countries as a, as a separate country. But we have no problem having chips from Taiwan in our iPhones and Androids and computers. We just do business with them. Uh, even their passport works, even if you know the country says that uh, even China would accept a Taiwanese passport if, if someone wants to go from Taiwan to China. They would open the documents, you're okay, you live in Taiwan, uh, stamped by Taiwanese government, welcome to China. Uh, and uh, uh, But it's not recognized. So, um, uh, so this is interesting because there is no real law uh, about who you can do business with. So if you get an invoice from a Liberland company, you can start a company in Li Liberland right now. There is no reason why you cannot just, you know, uh, uh, pay it, put it into expenses and, and just uh, do business with Liberland. So I think this is going to be um, interesting uh, also with all these free private cities and so on. The problem is that uh, the banking system would not uh, include Liberland. So there is no bank of Liberland and so on. So that's why they use cryptocurrencies because there is no other way for them to actually operate. So, so uh, I think uh, Vidya Lichka, the president of Liberland, would be a good guest for you, and uh, uh, and he likes to speak about uh, about this project. One more thing I wanted to say is that we are talking about territory now, so a free territory. What you can so that's a that's a space where there are different rules. What you can also do is. Uh, uh, create a sort of territorial autonomy uh, in time. So that's what, for example, uh, people from uh, TAZ0 in Berlin do. Uh, they have, a, they have a, I, would, I call it a village, but it's a, like a small area with shipping containers. And if there is any kind of problem with the state, but also with neighbors or with anyone, you can take shipping containers, uh, load them on a truck and move somewhere else without losing your capital. So you have these shipping containers, you made changes inside, you know, you built a gym in one container, a cafe in second container and so on. Um, and you can take your capital uh, and move it somewhere else in case of any conflict uh, with, with someone else. So there's, that's another way to avoid conflict and violence because the states, um, uh, if you're not, uh, you, you know, uh, cooking meth or something like that, uh, they will never send a SWAT team as a first action. You know, first they send you a letter, okay, you don't comply with this regulation and you are selling coffee and it's not allowed because you didn't ask for permission. So uh, it takes, you know, weeks, months, years, depending on, on the state. The German state is maybe faster, the Slovak state is slower, but they, they will like never come with guns and uh, at, as a first, um, first option and say, okay, leave and we confiscate everything. So you have this uh, time to react and the reaction can be, okay, I signed uh, uh, a new contract for land. Uh, that's very cheap because you just need a land with, uh, with something to put your containers on. The shipping containers are made for transfer. So that, that's the only reason they exist. So it's very cheap. There's a very large market uh, in, uh, moving these containers and uh, that that's another way to create autonomy so you don't create a, a physical territory uh, but you create a, a tempo temporary structure that you can move around for me uh, so this is how we want to create parallel police in bratislava and 
uh, one of the uh, advantages of Bratislava is that 10 minute drive you are in Hungary, another 10 minute drive you are in Austria. So we can actually switch jurisdictions if we want with shipping containers like every two years if we want. <laughs> and uh, and uh, this should provide us with flexibility. Of course, we don't want to move if we don't have to, but if we do have to, then it's quite simple to to actually change the lord <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, that's another way to freedom uh you're muted that's that's a super creative solution i think but you know because i was thinking of panama because it's been talked about panama i talked about you know grand romont of ocean builders and i told him i mean uh, i asked a couple of people you know around me also my girlfriend's uh, brother i said or, or you know just asking like would you would you emigrate you know would you move to Panama because I don't I don't know many people who would you know leave everything you know and the families and you know and just go to another location even though you know like super benefits you know you would you would pay like little you know taxes uh, they're very friendly they welcome you you know because you bring in you know uh, entrepreneurship uh, you create employment uh, you you bring in capital and uh, you, you know prosperity right and so I see like an abundant world where we could create this kind of circular economies coming back to this uh, term again, uh, where, uh, where, you know, not only Bitcoin is, but, you know, libertarians, freedom seeking people come together with investors and, and, uh, and other people and, and start like creating, uh, you know, a new structure. And th I think this is what we need, right? New structures before, you know, uh, sort of, re you know, <laughs> before before we change sort of uh, trying to change the old system so yes i i think that uh, it's the better way uh, especially because we don't know if changing the old system is possible so my personal prediction i'm not very good at predictions but i'll make this one is that it's not that the parliaments will dissolve and we will suddenly live in a free society. What I think uh, will happen is that, uh, uh, that this institution will be become less and less re relevant for our lives. So uh, it actually happened in Rome, you know, uh, the uh, people believed for hundreds of years that they're still Romans but their relationship to uh, to the roman emperor was non-existent it, it was the guy that was on the coins for a while and then even not that you know there were local kings and local you know feudal lords uh, so so this is what i think will actually happen and um uh, uh what you said about you know moving to panama that uh, it's true it is very difficult to um uh, to start somewhere else and you know create a new social networks new social connections uh, even know how everything works so even i when i went to panama you know you need to understand okay how does the healthcare system work here you know what are uh, how can i get a residency you know who do i know like uh, if i have a problem uh, uh with anything with a with a local uh i if i need a lawyer you know what is the good lawyer in bratislava i know i because i i have this social network this reputation system so in panama we have good friends who would help us out but this is really difficult and uh, creating kind of your your local group of people is uh, i think very very costly and it takes a lot of time so I think what is uh, what we are trying to do uh, is creating these local communities and then interconnecting them. So interacting, okay, uh, Prague Parallel Police and Bratislava Parallel Police, we know each other, we know that our values align. So uh, for example, I know that a guy um, uh, from uh, Prague Parallel Police uh, is... Uh, 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 is uh, growing food on a farm. He's, you know, harvesting um, uh, and and making honey in Africa and so on. And I know I can pay him in Monero, and uh, the honey is good, and it's something else that you uh, then then to what you buy in a supermarket and so on. So we create this, and it doesn't have to be a local structure. Um, and I believe that. Uh, even if it is, uh, there should be more communities. There are, uh, I, for example, there are, uh, let's say, people who 
uh, who want to live ecologically, zero waste and so on. It's not my super value, like I don't uh, like to um, uh, pollute too much, but it's not, you know, I'm, I'm not the, the guy that uh, goes to a zero waste uh, shop and, and uh, I have a solar system though, <laughs> but, but it's not my core value, what, it's what I'm saying. So, but there are, uh, especially these ecology communities and, you know, uh, nature communities, um, they are in most cities, they interact, they trade with, the, with each other, even though they not often like to admit that they are doing business, they, they are often, often trading, uh, someone is making cosmetics, someone is growing food and so on. And uh, you don't need to be part of this community, but if these community, communities create a relationship and they have a, a mutual understanding, you can connect them. So, so I... Um, so I'm saying that it's a really good idea to start a local parallel community. And the second point is it's a good idea to support communities. So even those that you are not part of, because uh, what, I, what I like uh, is that even uh, people that uh, I would not uh, agree with in a discussion, leftists and, uh, you know, progressives and these people, uh, what is more Im interesting uh, than to what they are saying and how their utopistic uh, world should look like, what is more important is what they're doing. You know, if they're unschooling their children and growing their food and they're willing to uh, sell it to me for Monero, like, okay, <laughs> live and le let live and uh, let's interact and let's uh, do something together. And I don't care who they vote for. Uh, or if they vote, and uh, uh, this is how we can cooperate. So, uh, so I personally uh, view these communities that have a different philosophy as allies because uh, because they are doing something themselves. They are creating another kind of parallel structure that they enjoy, uh, but uh, but it uh, is useful for me, and it also takes power away from the state because they are doing something inside uh, this community and uh, they're actually doing something. So th they're making the use of their freedom to do something. Right. And you know, this whole Corona hy uh, hysterical, you know, madness that is going on with, with uh, you know, the laws that has been enacted, or at least in the legislative process, even in Austria, I mean, it's crazy what's going on, the, you know, the insolvencies, the destruction of businesses, the, you know, the more visible, conspicuous uh, oppression of, of people's freedom, you know. So I think this will all uh, incentivize people to go more into this direction, which, which you, you know, what you've been describing up to now. Um, I agree. Yeah. And yeah, um, let me ask you now, what's the focus of your talk at the, uh, you know, seventh annual Hackers Congress, Parallel Polis uh, from October 2nd to 4th again? Uh, so yeah, get your tickets. Uh, uh, the discount code is total Bitcoin for my listeners. What, what, what do you expect like from uh, uh, like what, do we, what, what are people, the listeners, the, you know, the, the attendees are going to get out of it? And what is your focus of your talk? So uh, this year, my talk will be about uh, opting out and uh, uh, relationship to optionality. So uh, there are many definitions of freedom. Uh, the easiest are no one is telling me what to do and so on. Um, uh, but I really like um, uh, uh, a definition that's inspired by Nassim Nicholas Taleb, which is um, having an option in advance. Um, uh, so, for example, I'll, I'll give you a few options. So, for example, uh, now during Corona pandemic, um, for a for a few years now, I was working hard to. Uh, not have to go to an office. So I was an entrepreneur, so it was partly my companies, but still the culture was, okay, we all go to the office. So I was going to the office and uh, 
uh, a few years uh, ago, I made a decision that I don't enjoy working in the office because I'm interrupted all the time by, by my coworkers. I like them, but uh, if you want to focus and actually do something, then it just doesn't work for me. I, I realized that uh, I would go to the office, uh, uh, be there for seven, eight hours, and then come home and do all my work <laughs> at home where I could focus. So, so I decided, okay, I need to change this and uh, start working from home. Uh, I would still sometimes go to the office, but I had the option of staying at home. Now, when the, when the corona um, crisis happened and a lot of people uh, were, you know, panicking, they had to work from home, they were forced to work from home, they didn't know how, they didn't have the technology, they didn't know what to do with their children, family. It was, it was crazy for a lot of them. And I didn't notice, you know, <laughs> I was like, okay, uh, now I don't go to the office uh, uh, once, uh, once a week. So... That's a form of option. So you need to do something in order to achieve it. it. It's not free. It's not that it was always there. I needed to consciously say, okay, I want to have an option uh, to work from home. And now the exercising of the option is free and it uh, increases my flexibility. Uh, and when you uh, relate these two options uh, in, uh, uh, in financial markets, uh, when do options do well? The best uh, thing for an option uh, is if the volatility increases. So if the outside chaos uh, is, you know, increasing, then the value of the option is higher. So another, uh, another example is um, in, uh, uh, in January when, uh, when uh, I learned that there is a new virus coming uh, that, that there is a new virus in China, I would say, okay, I think I should buy a few respirators, few, maybe two, maybe 20, you know, no one wanted them. I just ordered them online uh, and I had them. And then, uh, then the, there were regulations the prohibiting sale of respirators to anyone outside of medical profession and, you know, construction workers that need it as a dust protection, the price, you know, uh, uh, skyrocketed like five times. There was a massive shortage and so on. So uh, for option, it is too late to or too expensive to buy it when the volatility already increases. So you need to think about it in advance. So this is uh, how I like to think about freedom is that, uh, that you should... Uh, uh, map the areas of your life when you want, uh, where you want to have more freedom. It could be work, could be emotional in relationships, uh, freedom from state, financial, monetary freedom, privacy, all these areas in life uh, uh, where you live and so on. Um, and it is best to try to achieve the freedom uh, or increase the freedom in good times because that's when it's cheap. If I wanted to, uh, for example, one one nice example is uh, that I bought uh, a solar system, solar powered systems, uh, not because uh, I'm uh, super conscious about the environment. It's a nice bonus that I can I can break and increase my uh, status signaling that, <laughs> that I'm I'm super conscious about the the environment. But I thought that um, when all these people connect their uh, subsidized uh, electric cars to the network. Uh, the price of electricity because of distribution, maybe manufacturing, but because of distribution might go up. And that's the time when the price of the solar systems will probably go up. Right now they're in huge deflation because it's an exponential field. Technology is getting better. So I didn't make a, a super good uh, uh, deal because the price of the solar panel in two years will be lower because the technology is going forward. It's, it's in the deflation. But when this happens, um, and I am dependent for, for my living on having electricity, I need to power my computer, my, uh, my other equipment, uh, I have a problem. I cannot, cannot work. 
And I'm thinking about it now. This all might happen in five or 10 years, but I want to have the option now and uh, wait uh, uh, and not wait with, uh, with getting it until the volatility increases and everyone is panicking and uh, panic buying solar panels. So um, this is kind of um, the topic. Uh, well, it will be streamed online so, so you can watch it, but um, I like uh, the, uh, what I like ab about uh, this approach to freedom is that this is highly measurable. You know, other, otherwise it's very subjective and you don't know if you have more or less freedom. You know, uh, you can say, okay, uh, I have a boss that is nicer to me than the last boss, so my freedom increased <laughs> or there's a new law that uh, whatever regulated cryptocurrency, so my uh, freedom decreased. So it's kind of a subjective feeling. But with uh, optionality, you have a payoff and you have a cost and, and you can just uh, do standard economic calculation also about freedom. So that's why I like this point of view. So we'll see how it works yeah, <laughs> with the yeah, audience. Exactly. I'm looking very forward. Are you, are you just going to speak or are you going to be like um, in, a, in a panel discussion with other um, speakers? I will also be in a panel discussion about parallel communities. That's oh, also happening wow. every Oops. every okay. year. So That's we all right. we all, we, okay. all uh, we all share uh, what happened in our local parallel communities and and we discuss it. I will also do a workshop about uh, uh, online privacy by tuning your Firefox uh, setup. I made a short online course. It's uh, also online on my. Um, uh, on my web, but uh, for for attendees, I will also do live Q and A, so we can talk about how to pimp up your br browser in order to uh, uh, to have more private bro Enjoy browsing nice experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I will also co-host uh, HCPP TV, which uh, will be. Uh, broadcast uh, during the whole HCPP that is happening in parallel to all the talks and everything. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what kind of interviews I will do uh, yet because it's all uh, yeah, being it's, uh, organized now, mm -hmm. but, <laughs> uh, but I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, I'm going to be one of the co-hosts. So uh, the, the website is digital-totality.hccp hcpp.zcz which i'm going to post but why don't you plug in your your website and where can people find you uh, uh so so my best website right now in english is hackyourself.io uh and uh there are my courses and i will uh, soon publish a uh, few short books as well uh there's there you also can find uh, option plus podcast uh I have four episodes. I will probably release the next episode with Max, um, uh, where we talk about uh, libertarian strategy. So we will talk about agorism, second realm, uh, parallel police, uh, crypto anarchy, Vonu. Uh, so these are all strategies for achieving freedom today, not a philosophy of uh, how the world should look tomorrow, but what you can do today. So that's a, that's a, a pretty nice uh, new uh, new episode. So that's either on hackyourself.io or you can go directly to optionplus.io and that's the, that's the page of the podcast. Okay, gotcha. And your, your website is jurich.betner.io, correct? Yes. yes okay, yes. Yeah. all right. Uh, George, I really enjoyed this talk. I think we should continue this maybe on a in a separate episode. I really want to go deeper, uh, maybe with other panelists, uh, maybe even with Grant Romont on the you know parallel communities or ocean builder sea pods and and see you know sure. what are your thoughts and your position on, and your perspectives on that. So thank you so much, George, and I'll see you soon anyway. Thanks for having me. Thank you, thank you so much, and I'll yeah, let's <laughs> keep it up, Good. right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Bye bye. All right, this is. Uh, was amazing. Um, I really enjoyed this talk. Um, it's, it's like, you know, the, the, um, I, I love the interest and the common vision that we have together with, with Jurich about, you know, parallel communities and, you know, just just uh, uh, doing like a, something outside of this of this of this madness and, and creating new structures, new environment, new circular economies, deflation economies, uh, increasing your privacy 
So there's just so many elements, so many facets to that. So make sure you uh, get your ticket um, to the to this event, to this amazing event with with amazing you know co-hosts, podcasts, speakers, panelists, experts. Uh, it's called, I'm going to put those in the show notes that the discount code is total Bitcoin, one word or cave and Davani, one word, uh, whichever is easier for you. And yeah, if you have, uh, if you want to, you know, contribute to my film project, uh, with a working title, um, human life rooted in Bitcoin, which I'm doing with other Bitcoiners or from people, you know, in, from the film business or experienced filmmakers. Let me know, please DM me or write me an email at hello at the totalconnector.com. I would love you if you uh, write me a positive review on iTunes, on my different podcast platforms, subscribe, follow me on YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever you are. It would help me tremendously. And, you know, spread this, spread this information, you know, and make this viral, share this video, share this, in, share these interviews with other, you know, freedom seeking people, friends, family, and, Thanks so much for supporting, for listening, and I'll see you soon again. Bye.